And thanks to the two David for organizing this year tonight. And our topic is Chibat Haaretz, you know, love for the land of Israel. I always feel that the place to start is at the end of Masech Tuxubis. The Gemara tells us various stories about the greats, the Amoraim, the, even the Tanoim, how much love and sacrifice they had in order to achieve living in Eretz Yisrael. And one particular story that the Gemara tells, always, uh, fa- I was always fascinated by it, and that is Rab Chia Bar Gamda. Rab Chia Bar Gamda, the Gemara says, when he got to Eretz Yisrael, after a long journey, he got off his camel and he wallowed in the dust. He wallowed in the dust of Eretz Yisrael. Shenemar, a person can tell him, Ki rotsu avadecha es avaneha ves afara yichononu. Yichononu means they cherish the very dirt of Eretz Yisrael. I always thought that this Gemara might be the source, if you've ever seen it, that when a person gets off an LL plane in Ben Gurion Airport for the first time, they kiss the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Probably comes from this story about Rav Chia Bar Gamda. The strange thing about this Gemara is that Rashi writes the following. Ki rotsu avadecha es avaneha Period. He doesn't add a word. Very rare. As you know, Rashi is the super commentary on Chas, and he doesn't add anything. I heard from my father, Zichron Uvracha, the following interpretation. On very rare occasions, Rashi, instead of adding, subtracts. And this is one occasion. Rashi leaves out the word Shenemar. He quotes the Pasuk, period. Why did Rashi omit the word Shenemar? My father suggested that one could come to the mistaken conclusion that Rabbi Chia Bar Gamda opened up a Pasuk in Tilim, and because it says in the Pasuk that those who desire Eretz Yisrael and have a craving for the land of Israel, they cherish the offer, the very dirt of Eretz Yisrael. And it was almost as if Shenemar, in Yiddish we say, that's what it says in the Pasuk. You know, somebody could open up a Shulchan Aruch, and it says in the Shulchan Aruch that we have to love the land of Israel. So because it says it in Shulchan Aruch, you love the land. Rashi wants to tell us no. This was a genuine emotional feeling an attachment, cherishing the land of Rabbi Chia Bar Gamda. He didn't do it because perfunctorily he was obligated to do so because it says it in the Pasuk. And I believe that this is a very profound idea. Sometimes we observe the law because we're meant to observe the law. And we open up the codes and that's what it is. But when it comes to Eretz Yisrael, I don't believe that it's a matter of following the codes. It's something that goes beyond that. It's the deep longing, the craving that flows and emanates from the soul of a Jew. I often tell my Talmudim who live in Chutzlaret that if they're feeling guilty about it and they're not fulfilling the law as it's codified in Shulchan Aruch, come to me, I'll find a heter for you. There's so many reasons why one could justify living in Chutzlaret. But if you want to come to Eretz Yisrael, it's got to be because it's got to be a genuine feeling. If you're not motivated by the soul, by your very being, by your essence, if it's not an existential bond to the land of Israel, then you're going to come here and you're going to get all sorts of difficulties, you know, challenges of this and bureaucracy and Misrat Abnim and Misrat this and forget it. You have to come because this is part of your very essence. And it's interesting that the Pasuk has two parts to it. The first part is, Ki rotsu avadecha es avaneha. Your servants want the stones of Israel. Vesafara and the earth, Yechonanu, they cherish, they love. So the first Rav Cook, chief rabbi of Palestine, Rav Yitzhak, Avram Yitzhak Cook used to say, why does the Pasuk have to repeat both stones and offer? 
He says the following. If David HaMelech would have emphasized the offer, the ground of Eretz Yisrael exclusively, then one could have come to the mistaken conclusion, which, by the way, that mistaken conclusion seems to be one opinion in Tosus, in Mesech Tixubis, that the reason why I cherish the land is because from the offer of Eretz Yisrael, we plant and we grow, and we have Tuva tribe coming around the corner, and these are the peros of Eretz Yisrael, and we have a whole slew of mitzvos, hatluyos ba'aret. So one might say, well, you know why I cherish the land? Because of the offer. Because it's the opportunity, it's the conduit to fulfill the mitzvos, hatluyos ba'aret. The Pasuk says, avoneha. What can you plant in a stone? There's nothing that you can plant in a stone. The love for the stones of Israel represents and manifests a true, genuine love for the land and its stones has nothing to do with what you can plant and what you can grow. It's an intense love, as we said, for the land, the land of Israel. Rabbi Gamda loves the land, and he really sets, in a sense, a paradigm for all of us that goes above rational thinking. It's not something that you can necessarily the Jewish people, an ancient people, and still after thousands of years, they still crave, they still pray for coming to the land of Israel. How do you explain that rationally? Nations have come and gone, but our connection to the land is so much more profound. And the amazing thing is that God, when he reveals himself to Avram Avinu, the father of our nation, what he reveals to him is that your descendants will inherit the land. That's so critical. The entire bris, the covenant between Almighty God and Abraham is built around the land of Israel. And in one pasuk, in Parshas Lech Lecha, the Torah says, Lezaracha Nasati. Es Eretz Canaan. Nasati in the past tense. What does that mean? After all, Yoshua, many centuries later, would conquer the land. How could it be that God tells Avram Avinu, Lezarecha Nasati Es Eretz? I've already given it to them. Rashi, in his commentary on Torah, notices this problem, and he says that when Akash who makes a declaration and a promise, it's as if it's already been fulfilled. We have a similar concept in Hegdesh, that when you declare something Hegdesh, you don't even need a Kenyan. You don't have to transfer ownership with a formal act of acquisition. And that's what it means when God promises the land. And it means that our claim to the land and our acquisition of the land dates back to the time of Avram Avinu. And this has tremendous repercussions. The Gemara in the Sefta Sota vacillates back and forth about what's called a bachar, a firstborn male. Normally in inheritance laws, in Parak Yesh at the end of Baba Basra, the law is that a bachar inherits a double portion. However, he can only inherit a double portion from that which is already in the possession of his father, of the morish, of the one who bequeaths it. If it's not in his possession, for example, if there are outstanding loans and he has debtors that owe him money, that money gets equally divided amongst the various yarshim, events to those who inherit their father. Only muhsak, that which is in his possession, that's what gets transferred to portion, to double portion, to the, to the Bukhar, to the firstborn. And the Gemara establishes that when Yoshua divides up the land, he is going to give a double portion to a Bukhar, who is the Bukhar of what's called the Yotze Mitzrayim, those who left Mitzrayim, not those who enter into the land. So the Gemara asks, that's only Roy, that's only something that the father might come into possession later on at the time of Yoshua when he conquered the land. And the Gemara answers, no. Eretz Yisrael Mukzekes Ilanu Mevoseinu. 
we have a chazaka, we have a, an ownership right to the land of Israel from the time of our Amos. And Rashi points out, as you know, in his introductory statement, in his commentary on the Torah, that Nachas Goyim Higid Liamo, Lasseslem Nachas Goyim, the whole story of creation, says Rashi, a story that defies our human logic. It's based on ex the Hilo on creation, Yesh Me'ayin, who can comprehend that? But it's all there to prove and establish our claim to the land of Israel. But I want to tell you something about the love of the land. But no Slavcha, the daughters of Slavcha, come to Moshe Rabbeinu and they declare, Tnu Lanu Chelek, the Eretz Yisrael. They say, Give us a Chelek. And the great Rosh Yeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva of Chaim Shulevitz, the Colonel of Racha, writes, based on the Ibn Ezra, that when they said they declared, Tnu Lanu Chelek, Lanu means we want our portion in the land not just on a financial level. They could have just said, Tnu Chelek. They said, Tnu Lanu. The Lanu emphasizes that everybody wants their particular Chelek, their part and their inheritance in the land of Israel. And this has tremendous meaning for us. The land of Israel is made up in a way that it fits the people of Israel. There's something in the very climate of the land of Israel. We call it Avira de Eretz Yisrael, the, the air, the luft of Eretz Yisrael, that is very special, very unique, and is appropriate for the Jewish people. I would like to share with you an idea that comes from two different Gemaras. One Gemara is in Mesech the Sot, and the other is in Mesech Bikurim. The Gemara tells us a story about Elisha and Novi. In Malachim Bays, Elisha and Novi was mocked by a group of young whippersnappers. You know, these were very rebellious youngsters. Apparently, Elisha was bald, and they called him Novi Akireach. They were making fun of him. And for whatever reason, again, that's for a different discussion on tonight. The Almighty saw this as a very severe punishment, a very severe violation of Makhish as Novi. It was at a time in which the prophets had to establish themselves. And this was meant to undermine the status of Elisha Novi, Chas Vishalom, heaven forbid. So God did a miracle and Dubim, and uh, I guess in Canadian terms, we would call them grizzly bears. I don't know, different kinds of bears. Anyway, these bears were very ferocious and they attacked these youngsters. Again, a different discussion as to why they had to suffer such a terrible death. But be that as it may, the Gemara quotes two opinions, Rav and Shmuel. How many miracles took place? According to one opinion, there was only one miracle, that bears came and they appeared from nowhere. God snapped his fingers as the Almighty could, and all of a sudden the bear showed up. According to the other opinion, there were two miracles. Elisha was in the city, in an urban area. He was not out in the forest, which is the habitat of the bears. And God created a forest, yesh me'ayin, miraculously. And Elisha found himself in a forest. And then God created the bears. So all the Mepharshim say, why did God have to do two miracles? What's called in the Gemara's language, mess. Why wouldn't one miracle suffice? Just create the bears. And the Gemara answers with a very interesting answer. I don't know how many people here are interested in the biology of animals, but the Gemara says the following, that an animal like a bear in a general behavior pattern is somewhat you know, less than full force, meaning he doesn't attack with a full force unless he's in his natural habitat. And the Gemara establishes that an animal has a nefesh. Again, it's not the same as a human being has a nefesh. It's what's called a nefesh Bahamis, an animal nefesh. But that soul of an animal is the, is the source, the origin of its great power. 
and the animal could only reach the pinnacle of its might and its power like a strong bear when it's in its natural habitat, because that's when it connects to the nefesh chayim, to that part of its nefesh. So therefore, God created a forest. Now he creates dubim in a forest. And now they link up to their nefesh, which is called the nefesh chaya. And now they can attack with full force when the bear is connected to its nefesh. An amazing concept. I don't know in biology whether there's anything that parallels that concept. But my question to you is, does this apply? apply to human beings as well. When we say that an animal has to be in its natural habitat to reach the pinnacle of its might, what about a human being? Does a human being link up to a certain atmosphere, a certain place where he finds himself? So for this, we want to quote a different Gemara. The Gemara I'm about to share with you tells an intense story about one of the great wisdom, wise men of Israel. His name was Rabbi Hanina ben, Rabbi Yoshua ben Hanani. And the Gemara tells us the following. Let me just read parts of the Gemara to you. Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani was held in great esteem by the Caesar of Rome and a very critical point in, in the history of the Jewish people when relations with Rome were critical. And the Caesar of Rome was boasting to Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania about how in brute force they took over Greece and in the city of Athens, they gathered together 60 wise men of Athens, the greatest geniuses of Athens. And to show the might of the Caesar of Rome, they locked up each one of these Atuna in a different subterranean cave. And no one knows where they're locked up. There are Shomrim, there are you know, guards, who will protect them and prevent anyone from visiting them. This is the might of the Caesar of Rome as it manifests itself in his control over the Chachme Atuna, the wise people of Athens. Yeshua ben Hanani says to the Caesar, I represent the Chachme Yisrael, the wise of Israel. Our wisdom is superior to that of Chachme Atuna, with all due respect to the great wise people of, of ancient Greece, we have Chachma that comes from the divine and it supersedes the Chachma of Atuna. At that point, the Caesar is very skeptical and he says to Rabbi Yeshua, he says, I want you to demonstrate that your wisdom is greater than that of the Chachme Atuna. But here's the deal. You have to go to Athens by ship and you have to find the Chachme Atuna and bring them here to Rome and we're going to have a demonstration, an examination, and we're going to investigate who's superior in wisdom. Now imagine the, the challenge that Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani is facing. No one knows where the Chachme Atuna are being held hostage. And not only that, even if you would discover where they are, they are controlled by Shomrim, by these guards. And furthermore, even if somehow you locate them, how are you going to bring them back to the Caesar of Rome? The guards are going to, are going to prevent that from happening. But Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya takes on the challenge. But he says one condition. I want you to build me a ship with 60 different compartments, 60 different cabins, I guess we'd call them. And in each cabin, I want 60 chairs, 60 seats. And that's exactly what happened. They created a ship and Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania set sail. There were sailors and so forth and so on until they got to Athens. 
somehow, the Gemara doesn't tell us exactly how, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya was able to discover the locations of the secret cells where the Chachmei Atuna were being held hostage. Not only that, somehow, miraculously, he was able to circumvent the Shomrim and he got to the Chachmei Atuna. And he said to the Chachmei Atuna, I represent a Chachmei Yisrael, the wise people of Israel. That's what I'm doing. So they said to him, we challenge you. Are you able to prove that your Chachmei, your wisdom is greater than ours? That you deserve and demand respect? So Rabbi Hananya, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya says, test me. And they barraged him with question after question, the deepest philosophical questions. And he was victorious. He held his own. He said to them, listen, I'm going to make the following condition with you. If I succeed and defeat you in wisdom, then you have to come back with me in a ship and come into the ship. We're going to have a great banquet and we're going to celebrate the victory of Chachme Yisrael over Chachme Atuna. If, on the other hand, I fail, then you can do with me whatever you please. And after he was victorious, he said to them, now you have to live up to your side of the bargain. And he put each one of the Chachmei Atuna in a different cabinet. And <laughs> they were preparing for a great feast. They thought each one, there were another 459 seats, that the Chachmei Atuna would join them and they would have this great banquet. Meanwhile. Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani tells the sailors to set sea, haflaga sasfina, but before doing so, he goes down, bends down on all four to the ground of, of, of Athens with a great argaz, a great uh, box, and he puts off our ground from, from Athens and he puts it into this box. They set sail. And they come in front of the Caesar. And Rabbi Shuban Hananya says, These are the 60 Chachme Atuna. They open up the cabinets, and the Caesar looks at these great Chachome that were so respectable and so respected in Athens. He says, Come on, who are you fooling? These are not Chachme Atuna. These are a bunch of, of, of disheveled, you know, people who are falling off their feet. They have no life to them. These can't be the Chachmei Atuna. At that point, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya takes the offer, the ground that he had taken from Athens, and he sprinkles it all over the Chachmei Atuna, one by one. And all of a sudden, they come to life. And then the Caesar recognizes them and says, oh yeah, this, these are the Chachmei Atuna. And they proceed with their challenge and all the questions. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananya proves and demonstrates that the Chachmei Yisrael are superior. So the Gemara says, what happened over here? Why did the Caesar all of a sudden admit, yes, I can recognize them? Because once the Chachme Atuna smelled the ground of Athens, that gave them a connection to the Nefesh Chaya. And they were alive. They were resuscitated. And all of a sudden, they spoke with rebellion, you know, with force against the Caesar. You know, why did you do this? And... Why don't you free us? And so forth and so on. And that's where the Caesar was able to recognize. And we see something unbelievable. The offer, the climate, the very ground of the land has a connection to the nefesh of those who are living in that land. And now we go back to the Gemara that we started with about the offer of Eretz Yisrael. The offer, the land of Eretz Yisrael has such a profound connection on every Jew that a Jew in Eretz Yisrael all of a sudden becomes a lot. And I want to tell you another story. I like to tell stories. I don't know if you ever heard of Rameir Chodesh, but even if you never heard of him, you probably heard of his yeshiva. It was called back in Europe, Slabodka, and here it was called the Chevron yeshiva. At some point before World War II, there was a call to the, to the student in Slabodka to make Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. The top-notch students in Slabodka refused. They didn't want to 
disconnect with their Rebbeim, with the Alta of Slabodka, who's the Mashkiach in Slabodka. They want staying here. The mediocre ones, at least according to the testimony of Rameer Chodosh, they volunteered to come and live in Eretz Yisrael. Rameer Chodosh once made the following comment. Take a look. This is back in the 1930s and 40s. Take a look at who are the leaders of little Israel. Who are the Dayanim? Who are the Rabbanim? Who are the Marbitzei Torah? They're all this group that came on Aliyah from Slabodka. Because when they came to the land of Israel, it gave them a brand new life, a hischachus, a chius. It was like a resurrection from the dead. And these were mediocre secondary students, and they reached the top level because Avira de Eretz Yisrael, the very atmosphere of the land of Israel, is so, is so inspiring. I don't know if you've heard of the Chida. I believe that Netanya also has a street called Rechov HaChidah. Every, every city in Israel has Rechov HaChidah. The Chidah, his name was Azulai, and he lived approximately two and a half centuries ago. He was pro- amongst the Sephardic postkim. He was probably the greatest genius uh, up until Rav Avadya, but I'm saying over the past centuries. And the Chidah says the following. Unbelievable. We know that there's a concept called exile. Unfortunately, in the history of the Jewish people, Dolus is something very familiar, too familiar. He asks the following question, where is the Shechina of God, Almighty God, during Golis? When we're not in Eretz Yisrael, we know that there's a Mokom Migdash, there's a Yerushalayim, and the Shechina is there in Yerushalayim. But what about when the Jewish people never are in exile? And he proves from many different sources in Zohar and Psukim in the Torah and the Bible that Kaviyachol, the Shechina goes into exile, whatever that means, together with the people of Israel. So tonight we have people from all over the world who originate in South Africa, probably, I would assume, in Brooklyn, New York, and for sure there are people here from Europe. And the Shechina is there because Shechita Begolusa says the Chida. What is the halachic parallel to exile? Is there a concept of golus in halach? And he quotes the famous parsha of what's called the rotzeach b'shoge. Somebody murders someone unintentionally. He wasn't karav lemezid. He wasn't karav Ones. He was right down the middle. And the law, as you know, is that he has to run to the ear mikla. He has to exile himself from his family. But the Gemara Mesech to Makis quotes a pasuk in the Parsha of Golus. In Masa it says, V'chai, aselo dvarm shel chiyus. We have to make sure that he is very well taken care of in Golus. Because again, he, he wasn't deliberate about the murder. It was unintentional. And we have to guarantee that there's plenty of food supplies and there are shops and that the population is a decent population. And that's where he's going to remain until the death of the Kohen Gadol when he goes free. And the Gemara says the following. If there's a halacha requirement of a chai, we have to make it comfortable for him so he could live in Golus, in one of the Ari Miklot, then Megalin is Rabo Imo. His Rebbe has to go into Golus with him. I mean, there are all sorts of philosophical discussions here about why the Rebbe has to go to Golus. But What's his fault? But in any event, in order to guarantee, the Ramam writes that Chaye Mavakshe Torah Bali Torah in Misa Chashuva. That if somebody desires to learn Torah and he can only learn Torah from his Rebbe, without his Rebbe, he's like dead. So we have the Pasuk of a Chai, we have to guarantee him life, and therefore Megalim is Rabo Imo. So the Chidah asks the following question What happens in the following scenario? A man goes to Golus, he was a Rotzeach B'Shoge, unintentional murder, and they brought his Rebbe to live with him in Golus. And now the Kohen Gadol dies. 
And now the Rotseach decides that he wants to remain in Golis. He likes the Ermikla. You know, sometimes crime, crime pays off, apparently. And he decides, you know what? So what if I killed someone? And so what if the Kohen Gadol died and they're letting me free? I'm very happy here in the Ermikla. What about the Rebbe? Does the Rebbe have to stay in the Ermikla? Absolutely not. The Rebbe says to him, look, as long as you were required to live in the Ermikla, I have to go with you and live with you. But now that you're a free man and you can go anywhere you want, I'm not going to stay here in the in the in the Dulles in the Ermikla. Says the Chidah that Shrinta Bigalusa, the Shrina is with us in Golus, as long as we have no choice. We have to remain in America, Canada. South Africa, England, wherever we have to remain. But when we have the land, at that point, the Shechina is no longer in Golis because we have the option and we have the possibility of settling in the land. And I remember when I first heard this Torah from the Chita, I had a shudder in my back because I figured, you know, the state of Israel was established. We have a Yishuv, we have any, any Jew, again, I don't know, during Corona, but in theory, any Jew can come and live here in Eretz Israel, especially if he, you know, if he comes through Nefesh Benefesh and he makes Aliyah. Where's the Shechina? The Shechina doesn't have to live in Golos. We have the option of living in Eretz Israel. Unbelievable. I want to say something else about the land of Israel. This Chida had a grandfather. His name was Rabbi Avram Azulai. He's very famous for a work called Chesed Li Avram. He came to live in Eretz Yisrael. Again, we're going back almost three centuries from Morocco, from Fez in Morocco. And the ship on its way to the, the land of Israel met up with a terrible, terrible storm. And they, they all thought it was over. There, there was no way they could survive it. But miraculously, they survived it. And when Rabbi Avram Azulai landed in Eretz Yisrael, he said that God gave us this miracle that we could settle in the land alive. He decided to find a professional, again, whatever it meant back then in those days, to create a seal. You know what a chotem is, right? You know, in the old times, that's how you signed a document. You didn't write your name, but you put a seal on it. On the seal, he had a picture of a ship. And that ship was drawn as a duplicate, so to speak, a replication of the ship that miraculously brought him to the land of Israel. So that every time he would seal with that seal, he would remember the nest, the great miracle that took place that allowed him to come to Eretz Yisrael. And this story about Rabbi Avram, I find very, very profound, very meaningful. When a person has a very powerful, profound experience, and they have an emotional, we call it his orus, an arousal, and they're aroused emotionally, then the fear is that with the passage of time, those emotions, that's the way we're made up, a human nature, we, they ebb away, and we forget those moments. And they fall behind back in history. And nobody pays any attention to them. We need to make a zikaron. Something that will remind us of those moments that were so inspiring. There's a famous Yerushalmi. I'll mention it because of this week's parsha. That on the very day of Yitzias Mitzrayim, the Almighty gave us one mitzvah of Taryad. A few days earlier, he gave us the mitzvah of Karben Pesach. That was on the 10th of Nisan. But on the very night of Yitzis Mitzrayim, he gave us one mitzvah. What was that mitzvah? It's called Shiluach Avadim. Which means that if you have an Evid Ivri, a Jewish slave, after seven years of, of service, you have to free him. And the question is obvious. Why did God, way before Harsinai, this is seven weeks before Matan Torah, 
why did he single out this mitzvah to give us this command right then at the moment of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? And not only that, Yermio Anovi says that there was a special krisas bris, a special covenant on this mitzvah. And the Yushalmi therefore concludes that if a person refuses to fulfill this great mandate and free his slave, then there will be severe repercussions. The punishment will be very profound because it's a mitzvah that was given with a bris, with a covenant. But why was it given at that moment? And the answer, I believe, is obvious, but very profound. Freeing a slave is a very difficult thing to do, not just for financial reasons, but moreover, you get attached to an event. It's like, for example, I was once at a, a levaya of a great rabbi from Ephrat. I'm not going to mention his name, although maybe you've heard of him. And who is the center of all that has paid them of the family when they eulogized him? They were all talking about this fellow David, a Filipino, who took such good care of the rabbi with love and with sacrifice and made his last years on this earth so meaningful. We get attached to a person. How do the Jewish people accept and embrace this mitzvah, which is so difficult to fulfill? And the answer says to Yushalmi is because on that day of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, when the Jewish people were so besimcha, they're in a state of ecstasy, that finally, they were liberated after over two centuries of slavery. Now they would appreciate what it means to free a slave. In other words, the day of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was an emotional high. And from that charge, they were able to commit themselves to a great challenge of overcoming all the impediments and freeing a slave after seven years of servitude. And therefore, since it was an emotional commitment, therefore, that's a great mitzvah, a very central mitzvah. And we are required to fulfill that mitzvah. This concept, <coughs> when a person is uplifted, when he's emotionally charged, he should make a zikaron, make himself a memory device. I had a student. Today, he's already a Rosh Hashiva. He was a student of mine in a yeshiva called Shalavim. I don't know if you know, you know of Shalavim. He spent a year in Israel. And then he got permission from his parents in Teaneck, New Jersey, to stay another half a year. He was in the yeshiva for a year and a half with one break during the summer. And on the way back from Israel, he took out on the plane a pen and a paper. And he wrote himself a letter. Dear, you know, with his own name on it. And he wrote about his feelings about Eretz Yisrael, the land, his connection, his uplifting experience, learning Torah for a year and a half in Israel. And he told me many years later, when he made Aliyah, that it was that letter that he was able to read from time to time that uplifted him and gave him that strength and that commitment to come back to the land. I once had a student from Michalala. I don't know if you're familiar with Bayit Fagan. In the mountain between Bayit Fagan and Gimad Mordechai, there are a bunch of institutions there, one of which is Michalala. This girl told me that after her year studying in Yerushalayim in the Michalala, she made a commitment that she would come back to live in Israel with her husband right after she gets married. And in order to give it a little teeth, so to speak, when she was on that emotional high, she committed herself, listen to this, she would not change her clock to American time. When she came in Aliyah five years later, as a married woman, she didn't have to change her clock. It was still on Israeli time. Every time she looked at her clock, she reminded herself of that commitment to come to Eretz Yisrael. And I suggest the following, that if we're required to make a zikaron, to remember the great miracles, I think most of us would remember, I can't say all of us, I don't know, David, 
Frank, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the six day war. Probably you're too, you're too, way too young. Now, now that I think about it, yeah. I was already in my third year of high school. And we have to recognize the miracles, the great miracles that took place in the formation of the establishment of the state and in the battles against our enemies, our adversaries. So many miracles. And if we let those go by, and they fall into the annals of history and they're not part of our consciousness, then I think we violated the following command. She visi Hashem le nisi tamid. We have to, the Pesach says, she visi Hashem le, she visi Hashem le, what does it say there? The negdi, the negdi tamid. Say it again, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Lenegdi, Lenegdi Tamid, right? Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Tamid. But maybe you should add the word Shivisi Hashem Lenisi Tamid. It sounds like Negdi. We should always be reminding ourselves constantly of the great miracles. I want to share with you a very fascinating insight based on Rashi in Masechta Subis, in that sugi that we started with, about the love for the land of Israel. And I want to share with you the insight of the Ben Yehoyada, otherwise known as the Ben Ichai. He wrote a tremendous commentary on the Agadic part of Shas. The Gemara tells us the following, that Rav Ami and Rav Asi, two of the greatest Amorim, were learning Torah in Eretz Yisrael. And during the summer months, the, be- the hot sun was beating down on them. They would pick themselves up and move into the shade. During the cold months, they would move from the shade into the little sun that they were able to find. So the Ben Ishchai asks the obvious question. Isn't that anything that anybody would do? The sun is beating down on you, so you get up and find yourself a shady spot, no? Why did the Gemara feel compelled to record this story about, about Ravasi and Ravachi and, and, and Ravami and Ravasi for all posterity? Says the Ben Ishchai that apparently they were in a situation where it was very challenging to relocate themselves. There were all sorts of impediments. But nevertheless, they overcame all these impediments and they put themselves out. Why? Says the Ben Ishchai, based on Rashi, Translation, that they shouldn't have some sort of an excuse to speak badly, pejoratively, about the land of Israel. And the Ben Ishchai adds that the greats did everything they could. That no one should speak pejoratively about the land of Israel. And the Gemara tells us about a, one of the Tanoim named Rabbi Hanina, that when he would walk the land of Israel, he would be mashvedrochim. There were gumos, the Gemara says, there were potholes, we would call them. And he would get down on all fours and straighten out the potholes so that no one would chas v'shalom, trip in a pothole and claim, oh, look what happened to me when I came to Eretz Yisrael and blamed the land of Israel. And the Nitziv Mivalajan, in his commentary Hamek Dovar, on the Parsha Shlach of the Miraglim, he says that Chazal accused the Miraglim of violating Lashon Hara. Where's the Lashon Hara? Did they speak pejoratively about any human being? They spoke about the land of Israel. Says the Nitziv, there's one land on the face of the earth which is treated almost like a human being, almost like a living entity, and that's the land of Israel. And if we speak pejoratively about the land, that's a violation of a very severe Easter of Lashon Hara. 
And we see it with regard to the punishment, the terrible punishment meted out to the Miraglim. One of the great Hasidic masters who came from a, a town in Poland, I don't even know how to pronounce it properly. Maybe it'll help me with this. It's Spitevaka. Spitevaka. His name is Rabbi Yaakov. He came on Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael two centuries ago. And at one point, he went back home to his town in Poland in order to bring his family to Eretz Yisrael. But because of the road, the journey, he got very weak. And when he came closer to his town, he checked into an inn and he rested there for a day. When the members of his family found out about this, they asked him, you were so close to, to home. Why did you have to check into an inn? And he said, I didn't want you to see me in the weak state when I traveled from the land of Israel back to our hometown, lest you blame the land of Israel for my weakness. Unbelievable. The Gemara tells us in the Sechta Sanhedrin about Sancherev. You know, Sancherev conquered almost the entire world. And the Gemara says about Sancherev that we treat him with kavod. What does that mean, we treat him with kavod? He sent the Jewish people into exile. Ten shvatim were exiled by Sancherev. And the Gemara gives us a list from Sefer Ezra of eight names of Sancherev. He had eight different names. One of them was Asnapar Rabba the Akira which means he's a great man, and mechubad. He deserves our honor. He's a very dignified man. So the Gemara says in the name of Rava, why is it that we give kavo to a person as rotten as Sancherev, who flexed his muscles, his power, and he conquered the world, and he sent the Jewish people to exile? Omar Ab Yochanan, what does that mean? He sent the Jews into exile, but he didn't speak words, derogatory words about the land. And the Gemara quotes a pasuk in Malachim Beis. When he sent the Jewish people into exile, he declared, he told them, el eretz I'm sending you to a land which is like your land, Eretz Dagan Vitirosh, Eretz Lechem Vikramim, Eretz Zeis Yitzar Udvash. And the Gemara says that he should have told the people of Israel that he wants to exile them to a different kind of country. Why did he say such beautiful things about the land of Israel when he was exiling the people? But the answer is, he showed a great deal of respect for the land. And as a result, Chazal say he was given that title, the great and respected person, Sancherev, all because he didn't speak negatively about the land of Israel. But I want to tell you this, and you know it as well as I do, the land of Israel requires a great deal of hamuna, tenacious faith. And if a person doesn't believe, in the Geula, that this is where the ultimate redemption is going to take place, then his grab, his uh, hold on Eretz Yisrael is a very weak hold. And the Shibole Aleket, who lived about six or seven centuries ago, he's from the Rishonim, he writes that on the night of the Seder, when we speak to the, you know, there are four Banim, one of them is a Russia. And he says, my vote is, Ilu haya sham lo haya nigal. And he'd been there in Mitzrayim, he would not have been redeemed. Why? Says the Shiboli, I like it because he didn't have a muna. The Russia doesn't believe in the ultimate redemption. And if you want to be part of the Geula, the redemption, you have to believe in the redemption. Without a muna, 
You don't have a shot. And with this, he sheds a light on a chapter in Malachim Beis, chapter 7, about the Nevua of Elisha. Elisha Novi prophesied at a time of great drought and famine that tomorrow there'll be plenty of food. This is at a period of time when Ashur, which is called, I think in English, Assyria, was our greatest enemy. Now, Elisha had a sidekick. His name was Gehazi. And the Navi tells us that Gehazi made fun of Elisha's prophecy. He had no belief in the prophecy. He couldn't believe that from a drought, overnight, Miraculously, they would have access to to food and to and to to sustain, you know, provisions and so forth and so on. The next day, a great miracle happened. This has to do with the story of the four mitzvahim. You may remember that it's one of the Torahs. Anyway, the miracle happened, and in the nearby town of, under the control of Ashur, the people of Ashur ran away. They fled, and they left the city immediately. And as a result of these four Torahim who notified the Jewish camp, the Jews were able to take all the food and all the provisions from this town of Ashur that was now a ghost town. And the Gemara tells us that the king set up a... Uh, at the Sharha year, in order to make sure that no one would gouge, you know, would take too much. You know, when you when you don't have food and all of a sudden you have access to food, you start, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You start, um, it's at the tip of my tongue, you know, when you, you hoard food, you start hoarding food. Now, what happened was that at the Shar Ha'ir, the people started rushing towards the Shar until they were able to be controlled. The crowd was able to be controlled. When they were rushing towards the Shar, Gehazi was trampled to death. And the Gemara says that Gehazi, because he did not believe in the prophecy of his great master of, his, of the prophet Elisha, he died. If you don't believe in the Geula, you will not be part of the Geula. And therefore, we have to, that's my goal tonight, we have to re-strengthen our commitment, our belief in the land, our love for the land, our amuna in the Geula in this land. And there's an amazing insight which I want to conclude with from the Ariya Kadosh. As you know, he lived five centuries and more in the city of Tzfat. <coughs> and he writes that we need a tikkun. We have to rectify the sin of the Meraglim. The Meraglim who didn't believe <coughs> in the ultimate Geula when the Jewish people would enter into the land. And he tells us what is the tikkun. For the Chet HaMaraglim, it's the mitzvah of Bikurim, you know, to bring your first fruits up to the Migdash. And that mitzvah manifests our chibas ha'aretz, our love for the land. Comes along Rabbi Menachem Zemba, who was never killed by the Nazis, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Levracha Hashem Yikam Tomo. And he says the following. Why did the Arizal focus our attention, singling out the mitzvah of Bikurim? And listen to this brilliant insight of Rabbi Nachim Zemba. The Mishnah tells us in the to Bikurim that Adam Yored Letoch Sadeu, when a person goes down to his field, Viroe, and he observes the following fruits. Bibikura, Bikura means when they ripen. Te'eno shebikra, right? Te'eno is a fig. Eshkol shebikar is grapes. 
Rimon should be care, a pomegranate. And the Mishnah goes on to say that once he sees those first fruits of those types and those categories of fruits, and he ties a ribbon, a band-aid, you know, a, a gumi around it, and then he'll take it up to the base of Mishnah for the Mitzvah Bikur. Asks Rabbi Nachem Zembo, why is it that the Mishnah singles out these three fruits? Dafka Peros Elu, why these fruits? Unbelievable Chiddush of Menachem Zemba. He was a genius of geniuses. He says that there were three fruits that the Meraglim brought with them back to the land of Israel. You remember they carried it with the, you know, with the moat. It says in the Pasuk, in Dvarim Vayavo Ad Nachal Eshkol. So they took an Eshkol. Vayichrasu Misham Zmora Vyeshkal An Novim Echad. Umina rimonim, umina te'enim. The exact same three species of fruits that are mentioned in the Mishnah Bikurim. And Rashi explains in his Pirish Ala Torah that the Miraglim took these fruits that were exceptionally large. They grew, you know, super duper large, and they took them back to Eretz Yisrael, eight Miraglim. Yoshua and Kalev did not, did not bring these fruits back. The Miraglim wanted to be Motsi Diba Ala Oretz to speak derogatory about the land. They wanted to show, says Rashi, Piriyam Mishuna, that the fruits of the land are very strange, they're gigantic, like the giants that occupy the land. The Mishnah, therefore, in Bikurim, singles out, says Rabbanachim Zembo. These three fruits, Lefisha Nichshalu Bahama Maraglim, these were the fruits that brought about the Kisholon, the great tragedy, the catastrophe of the Maraglim, which is all that picture of and everything. Lefichach, therefore, the Mishnah mentions and singles out these three fruits. And it calls upon us to make a tikkun, to rectify, bring these three. Specifically, because the Mishnah wants us to have a chibas ha'oretz in the mitzvah bikurim, to bring these fruits and express our gratitude to Hashem. We are no longer like the Miraglim, who see in these fruits something negative. We see something positive. This is great. This is something inspirational that we should be inspired by. And immediately after the mitzvah, I'm sorry, after the Chet HaMiraglim, the Torah gives us the mitzvot HaTliyaz Pa'aretz, like Nesachim of Yayin, Chala, the mitzvot Chala is in Parsha Shlach. And why? Why these mitzvot? Because again, these mitzvot of Niske Yayin and Chala, and of course the mitzvot Bikurim, these are all mitzvot that manifest our great love, our connection to the land. But again, as we said at the outset, it's not just the offer. It's not just the ground where we produce the mitzvot of Bikurim. It's also the Avonim. We cherish the very stones of the land of Israel. We crave the land. It's part of our nefesh. We will remember and not forget the great miracles that God brought about so that we could, so that we could inherit the land. We will make signs for ourselves to remind ourselves of these great miracles. We will be so committed to our love for the land that we won't be undermined by all the challenges. There are difficult impediments that we have to overcome. And Amir Hashem, with that love of Eretz Yisrael, we will be students of Rabbi Chia Bar Gamda, Students of all the great Tanoim and Amoroim, who Rishonim, like Rabbi Yehuda Levi and the Ramban, who would sacrifice everything as they did to come to the land of Israel. And this is a transmission that we have to transmit to our children and to Doros Haboim. And with that great Amuna, that faith in Eretz Yisrael and the Geula of Eretz Yisrael, which be Zochem Hashem. To the Gula Shlema, Bimheir of Yamenu.
Amen. I don't hear everybody saying Amen, but that could be because of Zoom. Well, I've just I've just allowed everybody to unmute themselves. So um, all right, let's say all all together, okay. Amen. 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 Gula <laughs> Shlema, we need it badly. Amen. Okay. If anyone so, has any comments, any questions, anybody wants to say it? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll monitor it. Okay, Freddie, go ahead. Hi. First of all, Rabbi, can I say what an inspiring cheer that was? Thank and you so much. If anybody could Aris did us about coming to Eris Israel, I would suggest you record this and send it to them. And I'm sure it will make a very, very big difference. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I need to mute somebody. Freddie, okay, go ahead, Freddie. Right. There's a background, background noise. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. I've seen... Um, it's so inspiring that anybody who Aris is dithering about coming to Eretz Yisrael, I would suggest you send them a recording of this lecture, and I'm quite sure it would make a vast difference. Can I just ask one other question? It's a bit of a klutz cashier, but I, I, I've got that kind of inquiry in mind. Uh, by the way, what, the way you've put the case in court, it would be QED. You've proved the point without anybody that's had it. Of doubt. Can I just add that Freddie Afron is our retired barrister here in town? <laughs> My father, in fact, was half betting in Leeds. Uh, so he may have heard of it. Right. in Leeds for many, many years. He was the Talmud of the Sri Day Age. He got Smicha from Sri Wow, wow. I've got the Smicha. Anyway, the story about the bears that killed the people who were mocking Alicia. I don't, I know it's a midrash, you don't question me, but I want to. What's puzzling me is this, Hashem goes to the trouble of making, creating bears out of nowhere where they shouldn't be, right? Right. Why was it necessary to also bring out the forest? It's enough, he's brought the bears, he don't need the forest, he can bring the miracle of the For bears. For sure, God yeah. didn't need the forest, he could have exactly. created the bears, and that's yeah. one opinion in the Gemara, he just created bears. Yeah. The Gemara wanted to teach us a lesson, both about animals, and again, we have it also in the case of the cafe to teach us that we are products of a certain environment. We can smell the air. You know, a person gets off a plane and lands in Ben Gurion Airport. Imagine if he could just smell the Avira of Eretz Yisrael and be uplifted and connect to his nefesh chaya because the land corresponds to the people. Why is it the Ramban asked this question a thousand years ago? So many nations, so many tribes tried to settle the land of Israel. And he claims that no one was able to do so. And he writes a beautiful line, the Ramban from a thousand years ago. Shall Aretz lo kibla osom. You know, if I would say to you, you know, somebody knocked on my door and he wanted to be a guest in my house, the lo kibalti osom. You know, I didn't let him in for whatever reason. That would make sense. But the land of Israel didn't let in, wouldn't tolerate these nations. What does that mean? I believe what the Ramban is saying, and I hope the Ramban is not going to be upset if I say this, that the land of Israel is a living entity. It's a being. It's not just stones and offer, as we discussed. It's alive. And it's craving for us, the people of Israel, to come back. When the Apostle says in the Torah, Rashi says, B'sorit tova. The land is desolate. Rashi writes, this is good news. In the middle of the Torah, what could be good news about the desolation of the land? And the answer is that the land will not tolerate any other nation. It's waiting for its people. This is a love relationship between the land of Israel and the people. Rabbi Yudak Alevi speaks about it so often on Tishabov. You know, my Rebbe, Rav Salvechik, used to always give us Kinnis on Tishabov. How many hours do you think it took to say Kinnis on Tishabov with Rav Salvechik? If anybody was ever there, they would know. It was eight hours. Eight hours of Kinnis. But the most, the most, the part of Kinnis that he put most of his emphasis on 
were the last, you know, Tzion Alot Ali, all those kinnis that were authored by Rabbi Yehuda Levi about the special nature of the land of Israel. It was unbelievable. You know, you as know, a student. You know, you know the, Mark Twain, the Goy, writes the same thing about Jews in Israel. That it, mm -hmm. When others were there, it was desolate. But when they came back, it changed. That's, that's the Goy writing the same. You know, the Shalah HaKadosh, his name was Horovitz. He lived approximately two and a half, three centuries ago. The Shalah HaKadosh. He says that there was only one nation that ever, besides the Jewish nation, that ever succeeded in what he calls a partial miktas yishu, a partial settlement of the land. Anybody know who he has in mind? The Arabs. And he asked the question, based on his knowledge of, of Kabbalah, why do the Arabs have even a miktas yishu of an Eretz Yisrael? And he says the following. Maybe you've heard it in his name, but it was he was the Chiddush. He says, if you go back to the Parsha at the end of Lech Lecha, where God promises the land to Zaracha, to the seeds, to the descendants of Avram Avinu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I should quote the Pasuk, but we don't have time. I would open up the Chumash. But it says in the Pasuk, He molachem kol zachar. That the mitzvah of Mila is a precondition. You know, every covenant, every divine promise has two sides to it. The Jewish people had to make a commitment. And their commitment was to the mitzvah of Mila. And that bris Mila is, is, is a contingency plan in the promise for the land. In fact, Yoshua, right before he crossed the Jordan, what was his command? The myth of Milo. You're going into the land of Israel first, every last male has to go undergo Milo. And it was a great sacrifice. And again, there are many explanations why the myth of Milo is so critical as a precondition to the land of Israel. But leaving that on the side for one moment, the Shalak claims that the Bnei Yishmael took upon themselves the myth of Milo. Yishmo was 13 years old at that time. And he says that the reason why they have any success whatsoever, but he points out, it's not really the Mitzvah Mila. Because the Mitzvah Mila has two parts to it. Mila and Priya. And the Bnei Yishmo never accepted Priya. They only accepted Mila. So whatever land that they, you know, they were able to settle, and, and he says that in a certain time, if I'm not mistaken, he predicts at what point they will have expired their claim, their merit based on their mixes mila to the land of Israel. <laughs> but basically it's, yeah, good, I'm sorry. Is that Mer uh, Merrill? No, Mervin. Mervin, I'm sorry, Mervin. Mervin. How are you, Mervin? Hey, Mervin, Mervin, I'm mute, I'm mute. Is Mervyn a Levy? That's all I want to know. Yeah, Mervyn yeah. is a Levy. Right, yeah. right. a real Levy. Good. Yeah, Good. I am a Levy. We need you in Yerushalayim. We don't have enough Levy, but maybe they need you in the Tanya as yeah, well. well Hashem. Yes, I am a Levy. An active working Levy every day. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Rabbi, for the most amazing selection of uh, incidents uh, and uh, stories that are just one after the other. So, call our governor to, uh, and I echo Freddie's words entirely. Um, um, a, a question I've often wondered about, especially after what you've said tonight, is that um, we all know uh, that the founding fathers of the modern state of Israel, Medinat Yisrael, in the 19th century, other than the, the, the rabbis, uh, we know, uh, um, but, but the, the, the people like Ben-Gurion, Theodor Herzl, etc., all these founding fathers, uh, none of them were religious Orthodox Jews. Um, would you say that during that time they were given, in fact, a type of Ruach HaKodesh, uh, the inspiration to do it? Uh, because it was only later on that we saw that, say, with Ralph Cook, etc., he brought a, a, um, a feeling of uh, Yahadut into uh, the proposed and hopefully future um, state of Israel. What's your opinion of these founding fathers who were I am very much influenced by Rav Cook in this particular question. Rav Cook believed that these 
individuals were very holy nishamos. Sometimes they were misdirected, you know, in the case of Herzl, he had ideas about other countries, but by and large, they were right on the mark. And he had such tremendous respect for them. You know, I don't have to tell you, it goes without saying, the soldiers today, it's almost the same thing. You know, not every soldier that we have, I was in the army here, Again, I was a little bit older. I did what's called Chlavet. I was 20, I was already 30 years old. <laughs> they were afraid that if, if they worked me too hard there, you know, something could happen to me. So, but I had to carry two guns, by the way. Um, M. Shesha and an Uzi that weighed, the total weight of the two guns was more than what I weighed at that point. I'm a small guy. But I met secular Jews that just simply have no background. They, they don't know. Unfortunately, some of the background they have and their attitudes are molded by the press, which is not always, as you know, so pro-Orthodox Judaism. But yet, with unbelievable sacrifice, they are committed to defend the land of Israel. Again, there are stories that are not so good. I'm not going to tell you it's all a bed of roses. I had one Mephakeh, he was telling me, I mean, he was half my age, whatever. He was telling me that he, in two weeks' time, he's finishing his, his stint. And I said to him, where are you going? What are you doing after you finish? How are you celebrating? He's, he says, I'm going to an Israel. He says, I'm going to L.A. And then he tells me, he's take, I said, how long are you going to stay in L.A.? He's, he's got a one-way ticket. Okay, so I'm just telling you, it's not all a bed of roses. But by and large, you, you stand in awe of the young people, I don't have to tell you that a young man just recently was, was murdered by the terrorists, uh, a lone soldier came from, from South Africa. You know, these are the people that we, we adore. And we, we know that, like you say, it's a Ruach HaKodesh. This is all part of a divine plan. And that's why if we don't force ourselves to live up to the obligation, as I said before, of remembering the miracles, Yo, Yom Atzmud comes. And, and what happens? Do, do, we, do we take advantage of Yom Atzmud? I don't just mean naf naf. I need to have a real, you know, emotional connection. I was for 18 years the Rosh Hashiva in Mivaseret Zion. Why did I choose to locate it? It was the Yeshiva mostly for Chutznikim. Why Mivaseret? Because the, the people in Mivaseret, it's called Kiryat Chinuch, and it's a kolel, they are nuts about Israel. Nuts. Totally crazy. <laughs> you can't believe what Yom Atzmud is like in Mavaseret. And I wanted my boys to be exposed to these crazy nuts. And that it should make an impact on them. Instead of chavrusas and learning sessions with them. These are the people of Ruach HaKodesh. And anyone who comes on Aliyah today... I believe is 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 enjoying the benefit, standing on the shoulders of those who came before him, who had this ruach hakodesh. So we call them secular Jews. We don't, unfortunately, you know, Rav Cook didn't call anybody a secular Jew. He used to use the term od lo datiim. You know, they're not yet religious. That's how he used to call it. But in Hasidus, for example, I don't know if you have any chance to learn Hasidus. I don't know what Rabbi Tav is teaching, but. In Hasidus, every single Jew, no matter how far from Yiddishkeit he is, has that, that Ruach HaKodesh in him. And the land is begging us, is crying out to us to return, to establish that, you know, reestablish the romantic marriage relationship. Rav Soloveitchik, my Rebbe, used to always say that our relationship to the land, Israel, the people of Israel to the land of Israel, is a marriage relationship. He had many proofs for this. And it all comes down to the fact that the land of Israel is a living entity. It's so difficult for us to express those words, you know, in, in rational terms. You know, we're so used to science and math and, you know, mathematically, what do you mean the land is alive? You know, it's a, it's a personality. It's amazing, really amazing. Anybody, anybody yeah. else? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I guess I would just add to that that you know it's it, in the, with the day-to-day -day trials and tribulations and, and living 
you know, from, from day to day, sometimes it's easy to forget some of the inspirational issues, which is, of course, is why you mentioned the thing about the, the seal and some other and, and letters to remind you and so on, because you get so taken up with, with the day to day problems and living and so on, and uh, that you, we all need, we all need occasion to be reminded, even if we remind ourselves. Uh, but it takes some work in order to to uncover those nuggets that that uh, that are out there to remind us of some of the. Um, and David, you know, here in Yushalayim, here in Yushalayim, I, I wouldn't say that in the town you have to suffer from this, but in Yushalayim, unfortunately, people so rarely get to the Kotel that you know they don't have that connection. When when we first came there to Israel, I mean, the Kotel, what? Wow, this is mind boggling. I remember when my father, may rest in peace, came to the Kotel right after the 67 war with a group of rabbis from the Rabbinical Council of America. He was president of the Rabbinical Council. And when he came to the Kotel, he almost fainted. By the way, my father did faint, not at the Kotel. You won't believe it. You know where he fainted? At Kever Rochel. They had to carry him out, his, his rabbinic colleagues. And I asked him once, Dad, why at Kever Rachel? The Kotel I could understand, but the Kever Rachel. By the way, the Kotel looked nothing then. We have a picture of my father. It looked nothing like, like it looks today. Right. He said to me, Rachel, Mavakel al This is Rachel who's crying for her children. I, I was overwhelmed. And, and like you say, you know, we, we sort of slip into a routine and we take it for granted and we stop thinking we should really go out of our way to have those moments over and over again. When we bench, for example, so much matter of B'nai Yerushalayim, when we dive in three times a day, there are so many occasions to reconnect to the land. And that's, that's my, me, not to you, but to myself. I'm talking to myself. I, I was a participant in an OU conference about 20 years ago in Yerushalayim, one of those international conferences. That we were still living in the States, and I came from there. And the highlight of a four or five days conference was indeed a trip to Kever yeah. I think, Ruth, is, uh, am, I, am I getting this right, Ruth? Uh, yeah, I want to make yeah, an observation. Yeah. I, I'd like to make an observation. I also felt very emotional many, many years ago I went to Kever Rachel. And I felt the same emotional um, surge that, that you, ex, you, you just expressed. But that isn't what I wanted to comment on now. I found everything very, very interesting, but people have commented on that already. What I want to say is I live in Natanya on Nitsa Boulevard, and I am, we're very well known for going for long walks. And I always walk along the Tayelet on Shabbat. And one of the things that makes me almost weep with emotion is on Shabbos afternoon, when I'm walking on the Tayelet in the direction of Kiryat Zanz, I see all the, what we call the, uh, al the ultra-religious or whatever you want to call them, with the tzitzis and the, the payas and uh, lots of children um, at the playgrounds, on the Tayelet, hundreds of them enjoying Shabbos afternoon in the sunshine, playing and having a wonderful time. And for me, this is, uh, it has been for, for years now, a, most, a really emotional experience because it's something new. Coming from England, I come from, I live in, live in, live in Leeds, um, this is something that people like that never experienced on a Shabbos afternoon. And they see the sea, the wonderful sunsets, and the, the wonderful climbers, and the trees, and the flowers, and the grass, and everything. And they are enjoying the nature of Israel and uh, with their children and their families. And I find that a really wonderful experience. I, I, to, to me, it gives me an emotional surge. Lovely. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing them. Yeah. Okay, anybody else have any comments? Otherwise, we will yeah. draw this to a close. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, brother. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rabbi Berzin, for a very uh, inspiring talk this evening. As I Thank say, it's been recorded. By the way, I, I think I'm even more inspiring in person. Zoom is like very <laughs> rough for me, very hard. I don't know well, if you noticed my voice cracked a few times. I, I, I just find it very hard, but I want to I want to say thank you to the people for one thing, and I don't I, I mean for many things, but I want to focus on one thing, which I don't know if it's obvious to you that someone like me would thank you for this, but I honestly thank those who opened up their cameras, and it means so much to me. And I don't know if other lecturers have shared that with you. I can't tell you, but when I look at the screen. And all I see is black on the screen, names. It's very, very difficult. It's, 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 we have a member of our community here in Katamon. His name is Dr. Dykman. He's a neurologist. And he's also an academic, you know, he's in academics. And he told me that at the beginning of COVID, they asked him to teach on Zoom. He tried it once. I'm out of here. He couldn't do it. No. Well, and a lot you, of it is because people don't open up their cameras. Again, I'm not, I'm not telling you, look, I'm not trying to be judgmental. There are many reasons why a person might not open up their camera. I'm not, don't get me wrong. But those who do open up their camera, I say, or as we say in Yiddish, it's, it's tremendous. And I, I appreciate a lot of people tonight opened up their cameras. And it, it's very, very meaningful for a person like me. And I thank you for that. I'll tell you, uh, in terms of Zoom, um, you know, we've, we've really adopted the motto of make, turning lemons into lemonade with this whole thing. For two years already, you know, we never used to have a Malabu Mark in Shul. We always had a Sudash Lishit live, of course. And we had speakers from our own community who could speak, you know, people who are in Shul. Yeah. So, since we stopped doing that already two years ago now, we, we migrated, we, we switched over to Malabu Malka. We've had a Malabu Malka every week in the, in the winter, it doesn't work out in the summer. We also have another meeting once a week on Mondays, which is more social and, and musical and so on. And we've basically switched everything over to Zoom. And we've, we've, we've used this as an opportunity to maintain some coherence. It's the glue that keeps much of the community together. Yeah. Whether again, it's entertainment, or whether it's a shiur, or whether it's a lecture, whatever it might be, yeah. uh, this is a way we maintain some kind of cohesion within our community. Uh, for a while, because we weren't even going to shul, because now Baruch Hashem we're back, back in shul. But you know, for, what, for six months, whatever it is, we weren't allowed more than eleven people in shul. Whatever, I don't even remember anymore. So that was the that was the way of keeping ourselves together. And now we've we've continued this. We've said already that uh, even after COVID, it's quite likely that we will continue these uh, weekly Malava markers online because they really fulfill a, 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 an important role in the community. Anyway, again, Rabbi Berzin, thank you very much. We appreciate hey, you giving your time to us tonight. Thank you.